So hi guys, so I'm speaking to somebody quite phenomenal today, quite interesting. I met him in Cape Town, I think that was about three years ago, although we, we sort of like have this dispute whether we actually met or not, or whether I just watched mm. one of his uh, presentations. However, he is the co-founder and CEO of the Credence Institute. He's also the co-founder of Mzanzi Meet Co. I, I think I have to like mention the co. He's also co-creator of, um, what was it, a Discourse Z. A, the schools of South Africa, which is also quite interesting. He studied finance and economics, been a spokesperson for the Meat Free Mondays in Veganuary, South Africa. He's over 10 years of experience in animal advocacy. Is that correct? It feels like longer, but yes. It feels like longer. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And in, has been involved with Beyond Carnism and Provage International. I believe you have a podcast, and I only discovered that this morning. Do you hmm. still have the podcast? Yeah. Okay. Fantastic. Well, that's that's the discourse today. That's the podcast. Discourse okay, today. so that is the actual podcast. Okay, that's that's amazing. And then, so Brett and myself um, are online today because I have a few things that I want to discuss with you, right? So, for instance, Mzanzi meat, animal advocacy, a growing population, and how that affects and will have an effect on animal agriculture in Africa. And so, I hope to be talking from local to global with you. Um, and then Mzansi Meat is Africa's first cultivated meat company. I mean, this is so exciting. I mean, this is really revolutionary, you know, given the fact that, you know, we're always a little bit behind when it comes to certain things. And I believe that you've actually approached uh, Cyril Ramaphosa, the president himself, you know, for this project and this initiative, which is remarkable because if we are going to have this conversation, we need to get it at the highest level. Well, that's a good way to start. Um, and <laughs> um, wow, you, you, you started at the top. Yes. So not, not, normally we start at the bottom. Um, but no, I, uh, yeah, that was, so look, if I kick straight off into that, that was an interesting campaign that um, we were looking to do exactly that, to start conversations um, and to speak to the highest person in the land. And mm. Saul Ramaphosa is actually a, quite a well-known stud breeder. Um, in, in cola cattle, amongst other is indigenous and African breeds. And we wanted to just go and collect cells from his prize winning herd and bring them to our facility here in Woodstock in Cape Town yeah. and grow some cells. And we thought, well, you know, what better way to say, hey, to the president, let's feed your country with yeah. your, like, you know, with your cells. Um, we, we got pretty far. We got a lot of people contacting us. It was quite interesting. We didn't really even do anything besides send out I think basically uh, a tweet or a newsletter or something and got a lot of, um, and even got maybe even a, a family member interested. Uh, yeah. We then decided to pivot a little bit. Uh, we, 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 there was a sensitive time in South Africa, it's now history. Um, it was about July last year, we had all the riots and, um, in uh, Durban and decided maybe to kind of pull back on the uh, political discussion uh, because it was such a hot topic at that stage. And I think, yeah. um, Mr. Ramaphosa obviously had a lot more stuff on his plate, quite literally. So um, we, we've subsequently not moved forward with that. We definitely think it's something that we would look at. We want to be still looking at indigenous animals, mm. Nguni cattle, and Kola, Bosmara. Um, so it's something that we would consider, and, and hopefully um, we'd be able to get back and, and have a conversation with him or somebody that looks after his, his yeah. animals. Well, that's amazing. And so I can potentially also even maybe put you in contact with somebody that can sort of like, you know, be a little bit of an instigator with you or for mm -hmm. you, you know, to sort of like get that going as well. So I have so many questions for you. And I found myself this morning looking um, at or like going through like a few online YouTube interviews with you conversations, you know, because oh. I was like, I have to be prepared. He didn't send me like an intro. I know nothing <laughs> about this man. And so I want to start from the very beginning. I want to start from childhood. I want to know what was life like for you as a child what type of environment did you grow up in um you know did you grow up in south africa or was it somewhere else yeah i, I mean maybe i was liking to keep a bit of mystery but you seem to <laughs> you've done your research uh, pretty well um so uh, i'll be mindful of what i say yes. um in terms of you know my upbringing i think um I'm as cape tonian as they come um born and born and bred in uh, southern suburbs of Cape Town. I, you know, lo lovely family. Um, luckily, I've got a merged family. I think the right way of saying it is now when a stepdad and two stepbrothers who joined the pot 
um, okay. when I was younger. And so we've got a nice big family, which is getting bigger. My sister's having kids. And so is um, my family now, my stepbrothers who are based in Australia. So pretty standard southern suburbs, Cape Town boy, okay. went to UCT, went to Stellenbosch. Mm-hmm. And um, I went and uh, started my career. Um, and I, I won't jump too ahead, but I started my career up in Durban. And that's kind of when I started being sort of exposed to the world outside of Cape Town beyond um, Table Mountain. Mm. I'm now back in Cape Town. I love it here, yeah. but I, I, <laughs> look, don't get me wrong. I'm, 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 I'm a very much a citizen of the Cape. Yeah. Uh, but I think um, that, that upbringing, which was great and yes, others would say sheltered, mm. um, was kind of, it was, it was great when it was pierced a bit. And I started learning about new ideas and new concepts. Yeah. And those led me to ultimately deciding to do such a simple thing what I thought at the time, which was stop eating meat. Yeah. Uh, little did I know that it would change my life. <laughs> and, yeah, and, yeah, change the tra- trajectory of your life. I mean, in such a big way. I mean, did you ever mm. think that you would be doing this? No, I wanted to um, actually be an accountant. Uh, <laughs> no, was... no, 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 Brad, I, no. I, <laughs> I, yeah, I, this is, I, I was reminded about this today. <laughs> um, no, I... I if you, if my granddad used to ask me what he, like he was an accountant and he didn't want to, he wasn't trying to pressure me into it. He yeah. was just saying, what do you want to do when you grow up? And I was like, I want to be an accountant. Yeah. Um, and I just thought that's where the money was and that's what I wanted to do. And, yeah. um, and then luckily, well, you know, luckily I just got way more excited about animal advocacy and plant food than yeah. uh, accounting. <laughs> Otherwise well, I wouldn't be working for the big four or whoever. Yeah, well, you know, it's actually quite amazing, right? So accountant working with numbers, you know, now you're just working with numbers in such a big, a larger scale in a sense, and also like accountability, not just accounting, you know? Yeah. And so, you know, how do we live a more accountable life in terms of like living in harmony with the planet and also every other being, you know, that we share this planet with? And so it's kind of beautiful. Okay. Mm. Well, I, accountant, I, I did so. not. I'll tell you, my, my, my parents didn't buy into it um but my, my mom she's been vegetarian for 40 years so um she laughed at me doing this uh yeah. but and, and uh, but they they bought into it and and, and obviously have supported yeah. the decision ever since but i think that i like that accountability um what i'm noticing obviously just being a new relatively new entrepreneur and, and trying to yeah. be accountable in, in so many other ways in business is quite yes. different and um it's not you know, I, don't, I think a lot of people are, are looking at outside of just the bottom line. And also, um, it's easy when your company is like what we're doing, because yeah. by definition, yeah. we're trying to have impact. So, well, I mean, I think it's amazing. I really do think it's amazing. Yeah, it's revolutionary. It's really, you know, it's 2022. And so, yes, you know, let's bring on the sci-fi. Let's bring on the new ideas. Bring out the more sort of like innovation ideas of like, how do we not... Harm. And so I know a lot of people from an animal activist point of view will maybe go, well, this is still exploitation because you're still taking, you know, whatever, whatever, whatever. But I, in my honest opinion, have found, you know, from my years in as an animal activist and animal and also an ambassador for the earth is that there's a massive gap between your animal activist and your animal welfareist like a social um sensationalism versus you know actually bringing solutions to the table and ideas that you know will catapult us you know into the future and and obviously bring about change you know the change that we we really really want right and that is mm. to like yeah. sort of like minimize the harm and minimize you know the suffering and and it, almost like eliminate it you know as far as we can or as far as well, possible yeah. yeah, I think I mean, you, you, you raised some, some interesting things that I've obviously spent the better part of 15, well now 10 years professionally, but 15 yeah. years as a person on this planet to think about, but um, which I do, I think about it every day and it's, it is yeah. quite, um, yeah, text, it, yeah you, you, you do get obsessed with it, but um, I think the, the approach of finding science-based solutions um, to the biggest challenges of our time yeah. is is not only more morally um, acceptable, but just effective. Um, yeah. Maybe it's more effective, so it's more morally acceptable. Mm-hmm. So I think having spent and listened to a number of animal advocates and and, more, and there's a dis- somewhat of a distinction between advocacy and, and activism, um, 
uh, I understand and I, I, I sympathize in, with, with, with someone who would describe animal rights as being sort of all or nothing. Um, you, yeah. you, you weren't able to just give women some level of, uh, of citizenship. You have, it was everything. And, and yeah. so the argument to say you can't just give animals, not to say there's a comparison, but um, there's definitely this, this, this belief that if we don't give animals absolutely everything in terms of um, rights and, 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 and appreciation amongst the legal system or whatever you call it, um, you're not doing a good enough job. So if you improve the cages that are, animals are being kept in, you are enforcing the system that um, keeps animals enslaved, let's say, yeah. to use that sort of terminology, which I, and I empathize with and I understand. I just know that I have to be more pragmatic in my approach. Yeah. And, um, and, and that's why, you know, I'd probably be where, where the welfare camp sort of is where I'm leading towards. But I think I'm very much more in my mind an effective evolutionist, uh, let's yeah. say, yeah. in that my approach to um, the, what, the work that we are trying to do is, mm -hmm. is change the food system for yeah. and and look at animal agriculture in a completely different way. Yeah. Uh, and if we were able to minimize the harm caused, which is extensive now, to something that's negligible within our lifetime, then I think, you know, that's probably something that we should encourage yeah. um, and not, and something that we can debate, but not something that we should boycott. Yeah. And, you know, and I'm yet to go through some sharings from COP26, um, you know, to see what, what was actually discussed there. And I know that last year we had the summits, you know, the, the United Nations summits, the food, um, the food summit, which is about, I think, 11 hours to watch, you know. And so I'm kind of like working my way through that as well. So there definitely is a requirement going forward to relook, you know, our food systems. Um, going forward. And so I have another question before I get into that conversation with you. Mm -hmm. Have you always had an interest and passion for food and psychology? Because, you know, like, I don't think somebody like you will go into, you know, the endeavors that you've gone into without, you know, thinking about the psychology behind, you know, the decisions that people make. And so, um, an interest in why people eat what they eat and how that relates to how we um, relate to the planet and to non-human species, you know? So, I mean, have yep. you always had that interest in food and, and sort of like, you know, looking at somebody going like, what is this person thinking? You know, like, how mm. do they operate? Like, like, where does that come from, you know? Before a certain stage of my life, I think it, my interest in certain things was just one of like looking at things and questioning them. So mm -hmm. I'd always been quite drawn to the study of economics because uh, it's a look at the way that humans interact in limited, in limited resource and scarce conditions. And that just results in so many unique and different things that um, you can almost never finish understanding. You know, it's, there's no limits. Um, so I think that's, as long as I can remember, I had that kind of approach to life. I was a bit of a devil's advocate, always sort of always up for debates, kind of annoyingly so. Um, be at the Bry, being the main guy, Brian, by the way, I think this is something, a story that I tell a lot is that I used to be the Bry guy, mm. um, you know, and, and that was my favorite part of, of a social gathering is just being able to sit by the fire and talk nonsense and, 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 and cook buri. Um, and then, you know, when I decided to stop eating meat, it was kind of, I didn't realize how many questions people would come back at me. And I think you, as someone in the work that you do, would be very familiar with people asking tons and tons of questions. Yeah. And because people kept on asking questions about my dietary choices, I kept on coming with responses. And then I kept on like wanting to argue and debate and um, help ultimately, hopefully, start discussing as I grew older. Um, and then you know this was this was in first se first or second year and then i did on top of that actually before i stopped eating meat i picked up psychology at university i picked up a few like philosophy of certain aspects of life and um on top of doing accountancy yeah. which is not a good mix um <laughs> i think it's a great mix <laughs> it's a great mix <laughs> I maybe i don't great. know i was trying to I was trying to unpack my own decisions for wanting to study finance and economics or accounting rather. And so I think at that stage, I was really trying to kind of gather all these things and put them together. And then economics was the kind of thrust 
because it's also a combination of psychology and how people mm -hmm. interact. And uh, it ultimately just led me, you know, I was um, uh, in my final year postgrad at Stellenbosch, I moved to studies, and I was like, I, I want to write my thesis. And I started writing a thesis on the Reserve Bank of South Africa, which yeah. is important, I guess, but it's boring. And I then was like, I have to just combine all this stuff that I've been thinking about and thinking about how people interact and, and how, the, you know, the one of the things I was thinking about is just like, how does the demand for meat and what are the inputs and all like, how do people interact around that? And anyway, it led me to write a paper on it. And that's what put me as an economist into a sales and marketing job mm. at a company that you and some of your listeners would be familiar with, Fry's. Um, and I started off like sales and marketing of intern essentially. And I mean, that's psychology 101. And, and, and then having these interactions with people where you would go and say, for example, hi, would you like to try vegan nuggets? And they would be like, no, thank you. And then I'd be like, hi, <laughs> I, would be, I would be at a, at a, uh, at a food show, like here yeah. in Cape Town, where you used to have the Cape Town food show, I can't remember what it was, good food and wine show. And then we would have, and then I would go to somebody next and I'll be like, hi, would you like to try a meat free nugget? And I'd do this like five to, you know, 500 or 10,000 times in a, in a four day event. And people would draw, would say, I'm okay with, would eat the meat free and wouldn't eat the vegan. Or yeah. they'd be more apprehensive about the vegan or be less about the meat free. So yeah. that is fascinating to me. That, yeah. that, that word, words and like vegan has got and so much behind it yeah uh but ultimately for me it was actually i had the same results because i just yeah. wanted to get people to eat mm. more plant-based food um and that's where it came back to me being a bit more let's be pragmatic let's say you know telling people to go vegan and vegetarian wasn't working i tried it's it for five ten years so how do you so you create the behavior that lets um the attitude change afterwards mm. Yeah. And, and, you know, I mean, I and I obviously being an activist, you know, you can imagine I've been quite verbal about things, quite outspoken about it, uh, very much sort of, you know, just say what I want to say. And and it has not worked in my favor. <laughs> it has well, not, you know, because people I mean, there's a, we get raised, like, as you know, in a sort of South African home or southern african household and it's i mean my my upbringing was very much my dad had an abattoir he was in the meat industry he was in the meat transport industry you know so we had farms you know people hunted and so i mean i saw all of that from a very young age and from a very young age i was like something something is not right here you know mm -hmm. but now you know you're six years old and your entire family eats meat and so when you all of a sudden go well you know you shouldn't do this or you shouldn't do that there's a lot of apprehension towards that and it's not the best approach to have with people you know it's mm. hardly a conversation starter and it sort of like puts what i've found is it puts people on the defense instead of like you know having that open invitation to have a, a, a conversation with you um yeah. i mean i just know from being a vegan myself i know that you are you are, yes, yeah. Uh, I, I say plant-based, but I, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, you know, and so again, with that as well, you know, I've said to people like, don't tell people that I'm vegan, just say I'm plant-based, you know? So she just eats mm. fruits and um, vegetables. <laughs> and so, but even when I'm friendly, I find that, you know, somebody that stole hams and eats meat, like they already on the defense with me, even if I mm. haven't even said anything, you know? And so one does have to sort of like use a more diplomatic approach um, and also a more gentler approach, I, for a lack of a better word, you know, when you do address certain topics. And I think, um, well, I'm very excited to be speaking to you about Mzanzi meat, but before we go into Mzanzi but, Mzanzi but maybe meat, can I just ask, um, yes. you, you touched on a few things there that I found yes. quite interesting. Um, I mean, uh, the relationship, I mean, firstly, do you get invited back to dinner parties now to parents' place? Yeah. If, if, if you don't, if, I mean, that must be quite a difficult thing if your dad is in the industry, or if he's not, unless he's changed his occupation. Yeah, you know, so, I mean, I was quite rebellious as a youngster in any way. You see, and so quite for, rebellious now as well. <laughs> I'm still rebellious. <laughs> but yeah. for me, the moment, um, yeah, I mean, I can share something very personal with you, maybe not online now, but uh, maybe in a one-on-one -on -one conversation. But, you know, mm -hmm. as a young child, I remember standing in front of, you know, these farms 
farm ovens and I saw, you know, a cow's head. And I'm talking about farmers now, you know, I mean, we know that farmers live on farms and they eat what they farm. And so there was a cow's head and there was a, um, a sheep head and I think some other animal, okay. I'm six years old, I'm standing in front of these um, ovens and I, my mom said to me that for two weeks after that, I didn't eat mm. anything. Like I refused to eat anything, you know? And so, you know, so for them, it was difficult because from toddler, I was already like, this is not right. Something here doesn't resonate with me. And so then you go into a teenage years and now you can, you have a little bit more of a voice that you want to use, you know? And now the real difficulty starts within the family dynamic where, you know, you're being difficult, uh, you're being disrespectful. Um, you're not honoring your parents, you know, you're being ungrateful, uh, you know, some people don't even have food to eat. And, you know, from my perspective, you know, and not to, you know, offend anybody, but for me, animals are not food for me. But I know that we live in um, on planet Earth and in a society where, you know, near oh, every species, um, near almost every single species that is alive is considered to be some sort of food or supplement or, you know, there's a use of, you know, a body part for them. And, and so for me, as an animal activist and as somebody that, you know, is this ambassador for non-human species, um, you know, there was definitely sort of like a break and the family dynamics, you know, and so now they've accepted me like that. And, and, you know, they're very, you know, some of them uh, come to me and they say, okay, well, you know, we're not eating as much meat anymore, or we can totally see why, you know, you are the way you are and, you know, and, and we honor and respect that. And, and so there's a closeness now you know, and more of an understanding. Also, if we look at the environment and what's happening, you know, globally, you know, people are waking up and I don't want to use the word waking up. People are sort of like acknowledging that there are alternatives that we can use. You know, we don't have to be so destructive that we can make a different choice. And and that to me is really beautiful, you know, in terms of that. So thank you for asking that uh, question. I hope you um, got the answer that you were looking for. But I do still find that, you know, Cape Town and the Western Cape is sort of like more sort of open minded. Um, so on the road traveling, you go towards the Eastern Cape. Here, it's a very big hunting community. Everybody likes to wear leather. Um, and when I tell them, you know, I don't eat animals, they don't know what to give me to eat. Even if you tell them fruit, vegetables, that's, <laughs> that's what I eat. You know, it's very confusing for people to wrap their heads around that. And so um, it's just very interesting also, you know, psychologically, you know, how people go into that mode, right? I don't know if you've experienced that on your travels. Yeah, well, I think uh, there's a few things um, there. Uh, certain areas that are more closer to rural places, they're closer to uh, a rural way of life, uh, closer to farmers understanding it, whereas I think people in urbanized areas become detached and it's easier to either like look at, you know, a packaged piece of meat or, yeah. or, or or say I don't want it, which is which is one thing. And 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 Melanie Joy, who used to be my boss and at Beyond Carnism, she would describe it as it's carnism. It's this sort of uh, system that uh, is an explanation. If veganism is a life is a is a is a ideology, then carnism would be the opposite, really. And um, it's just it's when it is so normal, when it is so natural, when it is so necessary or seen to be. Yeah. Um, there's just no pushback and you, you, yeah. and you can find it in certain places. And I, I like the way that you said waking up and then retracted a bit, because I think that sometimes people make value judgments on individuals that choose a certain way of life. Yeah. And I think that's wrong. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah. And, and I don't want to offend anybody, you know? And so, I mean, you know, we can talk spiritually, we can talk uh, religiously, which is something that I don't really, we can go politically mm. with everything, but really in the end of the day, you know, we are at where we are at and you know all of us have grown up in a certain environment that kind of like shaped us and molded us into who we are today you know based on set let's say tradition or uh beliefs or whatever that is right whatever that is also the availability of um and i'm going to use the example when i was in the himalayas hiking high up in the mountains i mean there was nothing there 
you know, nothing. Like you can't grow anything that high up. And so, you know, so you would get your nomads with, you know, the animals that they would, would be traveling with and they would obviously make their cheese and that. And so for me, I'm not going to go and say to some nomad that I've just met high up in the Himalayas that barely even knows about me or, you know, the ways of the world that, hey, you're wrong, you know, um, doing what you're doing when I have absolutely no idea of their lifestyle and, you know, how they survive and what they know and ancient traditions that have been passed on. Um, yet I can still introduce my, my role to them in a friendly way and still learn about their way, you know, and I know that before we started um, recording, you know, I was, I said to Brett that, you know, I've been on this mission of how do I bring the vegan and the hunter together? And I know that I've said this in previous interviews as well, is because from a vegan perspective, you know, they will say, treat all animals the same. And from a hunter's perspective, they are like, treat all animals the same. And so when you hear this from both worlds, you know, from both sides, you're like, okay, you know, like, how are we going to sit around the same fire, around the same table and come up with solutions, you know, that's actually going to work for the planet and for all species, human and non-human. Um, and with that, I, I want to talk more about Mzanzi meat with you today, because I find that very interesting, but I just want to touch a little bit on, talk to me a little bit about the Credence Institute. Uh, the Credence Institute is the think tank dedicated to um, advancing the interests of animals. Quote unquote, the Credence Institute strives for a society where animal interests are no longer ignored for the sake of human endeavors. In other words, where animals are no longer exploited, you know, the way that we've been exploiting them. And so speak to me a little bit about that. Happy to do so. And it's uh, an organization that I co-founded with a friend of mine, Ludwig Roll, um, and he's, uh, He's more of a philosopher, and, and then I've just got the experience of actually um, trying to philosophize and do what he does, do what he says in, in practice. Let's say, um, uh, credence. So we started it in 2019, and I think that's when we actually you and I would have met because the first time it ever came to light was at the Cape Town. Yes, it was, it was new. At Cape new. Town, yeah. yeah, it was brand new. It was fresh, yeah. fresh paint, and. Um, up to my, like I've been working in this space for roughly 10 years and, and getting frustrated with the way that animal advocacy is done and, and also wanting to do something in the way that I think we should, we should try, or at least I wanted to try. Uh, and I had just identified that there's just this lack of available research within South Africa, within Africa, on the topics of related to what we see um, playing out, and, and whether it's companion animals or, um, um, work animals, but primarily livestock animals. There's, 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 there's information about how many animals we kill, but there's maybe different, there's not as ways of like, what about the ways in um, reducing the suffering? What are the most effective ways? <clears throat> Excuse me, or what, is, what, are the, what are the best ways to talk to people about um, South Africans about uh, this, uh, these topics? I mean, we, so we've, we've looked at a few things, of quite, a, quite a wide range of subjects, but um, we looked at the livestock, ex the live exploitation of livestock and, and, and trying to understand uh, what Muslim South Africans thought about it. You know, mm -hmm. they have a, have a voice that had probably been left out of the equation for the most part, and, and I think an influential one. So Credence is a think tank in terms of trying to find out what people think and trying to get it out there so that uh, the media can talk about it with a bit more less sound bitey uh, yes. lack of information yeah uh, with the, the the policymakers can have a bit more in front of them to make decisions upon businesses can recognize trends to say that they wanted to work with and then ultimately public you know we wanted an informed public that were able to make decisions as they would hopefully when they go to the ballot box uh on on how they perceive animals should be treated in society but with yeah. a lot more information yeah. so our, our largest well, our largest project to date, and we've worked on a few projects, but the two main projects that we've worked on has been Animal Advocacy Africa. It's a yes, program. That's another question and, I have for you, but go yeah, ahead. So, <laughs> uh, I'll touch on it briefly, and 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 there, it's it's simply doing it's it's trying to answer this one. It's trying to solve one problem, challenge. The animal advocacy movement in Africa doesn't get enough funding. Mm. If you look at it compared to other emerging markets or or other parts of the global south. We don't get enough funding uh, and it's seen as like a, well, it's not an issue here. Factory farming doesn't exist. Well, uh, we know that that's not the case. And I, and I know someone like you, I could see you working up, so I didn't want to. Um, yeah. And yeah. so 
the biggest thing is also that we have the opportunity to leapfrog in, in Africa and not go down the same thing that people in, um, in industrialized areas are trying to now reverse and do rewilding, et cetera, because of um, industrialized uh, livestock animal agriculture. So we, we, the project there was working with about, you know, or speaking to about 50 odd organizations and then doing 10 projects with 10 organizations to get them more funding. And whether it's Uganda, Ghana, Nigeria, you name it, we try to find more money for, to help these people do the work that they're doing because they know what, what often happens with international organizations is they say, here's a million bucks, do what we say. Whereas mm. we were saying, these are people closer to the ground, they have a better understanding on the areas of focus that they need to look at. How do we help them spend their money better in an area mm. that they think is better focused? So that's Animal Advocacy Africa. And, and yeah. I can touch on a little bit more. And then the other main project, which is probably, you know, the, well, the, besides us having opinions on sort of topics like hunting and, and, and trying to add more nuance to, I think Ludwig and I are trying to add more nuance to the conversation about animals in South Africa. That would be like what we're trying to do with Credence. So the final project, uh, or the project that we've just finished up has been a consumer perception study on uh, South Africans' view on plant-based and cultivated meat. It was a sample size of about a thousand people, demographically representative, race, gender, uh, income. And we wanted to find out what South Africans thought about these things. It's quite encouraging, the, the adoption and, and the, future, the future habits that people are saying. It's quite encouraging when you've got a typical South African, so not probably somebody that looks like me, who looks like a hipster, uh, <laughs> but probably somebody, somebody from industrial, a, a sort of a, a lower income group, but in from KZN, uh, Zulu speaking, who's concerned about their environment mm. and is saying, I would like to choose more, uh, choose things that are better for my environment in the future. Yeah. So, so it's, it's trying to then get that information which uh, into the media, into the retailers, into the public discourse uh, and, and get people to be more informed on their decisions. And ultimately, we're, our theory of change is that yeah. once people are more informed, they make better decisions that ultimately help have a better impact on, on animals. Uh, and that's so true. We can actually finish the conversation now. <laughs> we can actually just finish up. You know, because it's so important. You know, I've been using the phrase um, have the conservation conversation, have it, you know, whatever that is for you, have that conversation. And so what I see happening with you um, from wanting to be an accountant, you know, to going into business and economics um, and then going into psychology, you know, and then now having sort of like co-created, you know, your nonprofit along with Mzanzi Meat is it's mind and heart coming together. Whereas normally when somebody goes into economics and business, it's very much sort of like money driven and, you know, focused on like, you know, profit. But when we bring psychology into it a little bit, then that sort of like goes more sort of like to the humanitarian side, I almost want to say with that, you know? And so I make a joke with people because I always say like, I have tried I have tried working just with animals. Okay, I've had no interest to work with human beings and it has not worked, you know, because in the end of the day, we are the number one species um, that is causing all this, you know, the problems that we have currently. And, and so in order to do anything, we have to address us with, I think, uh, open conversation, uh, open heart conversations as well, you know, where we really take, you know, the human um, into account as well as the animal into account as well as the plant into account, you know, um, and not just say, you know, what I tried to do was like, no, 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 I just want to work with the animals. Like you can work with the human beings. I just, I'm just over here working with animals. And yet I find myself, you know, being a little bit, um, like I said, rebellious, you know, and then, you know, and then I find myself having like the most beautiful conversations with people and really like acting from a place of love and concern for these human individuals, you know, even though I'm like, okay, you know, you know, the anim animals come first and the earth comes first. Um, but I think what you guys are creating, uh, you know, with your conversation for people is like knowledge is power and the more informed we are, the better our choices and decisions we make and also just the better for everybody else, you know, that we share the earth with. So there is a difference between animal activists and animal welfareists, as you are aware. 
um, taking into account policies, practices, traditions, and public opinions, right? And so I can imagine that the marketing aspect for you guys has been quite challenging, you know, and how do we word certain things as not to offend? And how do we be inclusive of people, you know, sort of like in all sectors? Um, I mean, talk to me a little bit about that. What does that look like? Because South Africa, and I just want to add this, because South Africa is predominantly a country um, where we market to people that, and I'm going to use the example, you know, for men now, is that you are not a man if you don't eat meat. Okay, and so mm -hmm. to be a man in a South African man, you have to bry and you have to hunt and you have to bond over all of these acts. And so speak to me about the marketing aspect, um, you know, what you've seen in the past 15 years going from working with NGOs and NPOs to, you know, being part of sort of like animal advocacy to, you know, this, how does that marketing tool look like? It's very, um... It's a good question. It's 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 difficult to answer. Yeah. Uh, I think. Look, I'll tell you the one thing. Um, South Africans, after spending and traveling a bit and and, and um, working overseas and spending time in Germany and uh, South Africans definitely have an attachment to meat that's just it is different. <laughs> it's just like it's you know I would I was working at Provid International as you highlighted in the beginning and and yeah. there was in Berlin and at one stage it was like a hundred and odd people like probably about no in the head office is about 80 people from yeah. all over the world and you'd also go and, and spend time with other people and maybe because it was a circle of friends that I had developed up there but like the like meat even in yeah meat is is so it's it's the social the social currency that starts a conversation you go to yeah. Bry that you go to Bry you don't go to friends house you go to Bry if you arrive at a brine, you don't have meat, you put something else on the table, you just, it's like, you know, it's a, it's a shock to the system for everybody. And I've, I've, we both have experienced that for, um, I've, you know, for me, it's 15 years. And, um, and I can't get over it. I will be honest. I get, like, I, I, I go to these things and I'm like, just for once, I don't want to talk about it. And mm. it's always spoken about and you're like, you know, mm. so it is frustrating. It, I think it is different in the South African context compared to the rest of the world. Uh, I, I'd love to see why that's the case when we actually don't eat as much meat and you look at it per capita consumption mm. as parts of Europe and Australia and, and America, but maybe in a sort of upper middle class um, groupings, like you know, probably the ones that we, we find ourselves in sometimes or middle class at the very least, uh, they do eat, we do eat a lot of meat and it is cheap by comparison. So I think those parts also play a uh, hand. You know, red meat steak in South Africa is a lot cheaper than you'd find in Europe. And I, I don't have a good answer in that part. It's, I think it is the case. And so what, what I've tried to do with Mzanzi is brief my team is that we just embrace this. Mm. We embrace the fact that the National Heritage Day has been rebranded sort of unofficially as Bry Day. I mean, if you, if, you don't, if you don't start with that appreciation, yeah. if that's where your country is, what your country is mm. like, you're going to struggle to set a product that is yes. um, trying to compete with that mindset. So we and, and Shishinyama as as is is and Poiki, you know, there there's so many things built on. These are all yeah. things that, like that I can just start rattling off. Mzanzi is trying to look at that and say, from the get-go, we want to say, how do we get ourselves in there? Mm. Whereas I feel like yes. plant based was always an alternative. Yeah. And and I think at the moment it cannot be an alternative anymore. It yeah. has to be mm. it has to be there. I've got no other way to describe it besides no, that. No, it's I think perfect. in the future, I think yeah. in the future we'll we'll look at it differently. But yeah. I think currently that we need to be there, and that place is defined by price, taste, convenience, mm. big one. And Very. my my theory and, and the thing that I've been pushing for a couple of years now is culture. And if you aren't hitting across the marks with your marketing, with your messaging, if you're an animal rights activist. Um, you're not going to make it. You're not going to make impact. And even if it's talking about climate, even yeah. if it's talking about gender, race, like if those, it's difficult. It's a bit more abstract when you talk in price and taste. But there are ways to sort of make, make it comparable. If people aren't able to, if there are significant barriers there, they're never going to hear your message. They're never yeah. going to hear about your product. 
because it's yeah. like nope i'm not going to even think about this so we i don't have the i don't have a straight answer i'll tell you what it, i i agree with the statement that south africans love meat it's it's like obvious we love it it's the braai it's the hunting particularly in the afrikaans culture particularly in zulu culture um, a different appreciation uh, but a similar outcome and and i think we are looking at it and saying let's let's join this and we are saying that we're going to be innovative in that we might be producing something that one day is better than steak yeah and it's, yeah but it's and steak and also cruelty free and you know i want to yeah. touch base on and so I'm sorry that goes without saying I, I i i sometimes i think i like forget that i'm like you know i'm in all sense of the word beyond meat in that way i'm like i'm we're, we only thinking about making yeah. food where cruelty is at a minimum yeah look i mean i you know so there's so much in my mind that i want to say to you now so where am i going to start okay and so um look you know we definitely have to look at food systems and i think that's what you're looking at we also have to look at global trends at the moment and so i think and i you know i've had many conversations with people that are either in the farming industry or that are you know hunt are hunters themselves and and some of them have come forward and said well we don't want to hunt anymore you know, and I always wait for because I just love that moment in a conversation where I'm speaking to somebody and then I just wait for that moment where they go, I can't do that anymore. You know, or like I can't shoot a rhino anymore or I can't shoot a buffalo anymore. And so there is a shift in that. And for me, as you know, this animal activist and advocate, you know, like that's what I want to hear from people. And so I've kind of put myself out there to have the conversation, the uncomfortable conversations, you know, with some people, but because I care enough about, you know, my cause and, you know, about non-human species to go and actually have, you know, this with people and present, you know, the alternative to them, you know, whether they've got a chicken industry or like it's cattle farming or what it is, you know, um, I should say to them, well, do you know about this and that happening in Europe? And are you aware of this and that product that's coming out now? And, you know, have you been to Cape Town? And, you know, have you tried Romeo the vegan butcher? You know, um, have you tried, you know, his chicken kebabs or like the vegan kebabs and, and stuff like that? And so, because in the end of the day, we can preach to the choir or we can, we can actually have on, honest conversations with people that just aren't aware of you know what's happening and so when i spoke to jay um i said jay like you know i need to speak to somebody really interesting and he was like well you need to speak to brett thompson and i was like okay i'm gonna speak to him so with that we know that animal agriculture has a negative impact on the environment public health and species on this planet okay so that's why we are looking at alternative food systems um and then we will touch a little bit base um a little bit on faux foods and sort of cultivated meat and then i just wanted to say we also know that africa's population is expanding and that the world's population will increase from 7.8 billion to 9.9 .9 billion people in 250, oh, 250 in 2050 okay um, and that uh, Africa's population will double by 2050 and that that would mean that 2.5 billion people more than a quarter of the world's people will be in Africa and also I don't know if you knew this like I think there's 10 or 11 countries um, that has exponential population growth and those 10 top of the list 10 countries are all based in Africa it's all African countries and so I think alternative food systems you know given what we know about African agriculture um, is definitely important also given the fact that you know when the population increases we know that that will have a direct and drastic impact on um, you know animal agriculture and also the suffering of animals and the impact on the environment. And so on that note, let's get into Mzanzi meats because this is so interesting to me. Um, I am so impressed with you guys and you know what I've read, what you've sent me, um, just you know, the the genius behind it and also the the um what do, I, what do I want to use now? Just the, the ballsiness of it, you know, to tackle this in South Africa. I mean, it's just so great. So let's get into Mzanzi needs. Explain to me, uh, you know, 
faux foods and cultivated meats and you know the origin and the birth of enzymes in there. Yeah, so I, it's not plant-based. I, I, that's just as a starting point. Uh, yeah. We are um, plant-based as I eat plant-based foods all the time, meat alternatives, et cetera, uh, beyond meat fries, where they're taking plant proteins and they are um, combining with the with flavorants and flavors and spices, et cetera, and, and making it, texturizing it to taste like meat. And, and I, I eat it all the time. Uh, I worked there for 10 years. So I'm biased, but I obviously love it. Yeah. When the reason, okay, well, I think cultivated meats, Another reason why it exists and why people why it isn't just plant based is because, firstly, as a couple of Dutch scientists some 20 years ago now saw that um, even longer than 20 years ago um, saw that you know if if we wanted to make something to get people to stop eating animals it needed to be as good as as what we've already been accustomed to and I think they probably felt that plant based might not achieve uh, what it set out to achieve. And as much as cultivated, it might not achieve what it set out to, but mm. it's still, we are trying. So they, this is about 2013 was the first time a burger was cultivated. So what, when I say cultivated, the process is we take a selection of, of, of cells from a live animal. Um, you can do a biopsy, a needle biopsy, which is done by a vet. It's a very small amount. It could be about the size of a peppercorn. The animal is fine. It is goes on with its their day. Um, or you can take stem cells from a umbilical cord, which if during a birthing event, mm. again, it's not intrusive because that was a process that was going to be happening naturally. Anyway, that's where we start with the cells. We bring them to where we're at now in Woodstock. Uh, we are in a facility which has a lab and, and soon to be a food bioprocessing room um, where we take those cells and we try to get to start doubling, doubling and doubling and doubling. And that's what cells do. But we need to replicate uh, the, what happens in your body and what happens in my body and what happens in a cow's body. We're all, it's all the same. That's the best part of this whole thing. You get to realize how we are all mammals. 37 degrees, you keep us at 37 degrees. Um, you add amino acids, nutrients, just fats, salts, and the, that, if you do it right, which we've done, starts these cells multiplying and it becomes exponential. When it starts happening at that rate, we are putting it on something which is a scaffold. And it's like the fact that you are a 3D person. I mean, I can see you in 3D. Well, now I'm seeing you in 2D, but if I saw you in real life, you would be um, a, a, a person with layers. Um, that's also the same way that we're just re replicating with these scaffolds, which ours at the moment, and we're going to be playing around with this, but are mycelium based. And I think a lot of people are familiar with that. It's fungus, mushroom, you name it. Um, and it attaches to that and it grows. Once it gets, and that ha and it happens in something, um, which as I said, keeps it at 37 degrees. It's, when it's done at scale, the easiest way for me to describe it is it will look like a craft brewery. There'll be these large vats where this is happening in. Uh, and then as, and this is the same. So when you, we would then would get our muscle and fat from that opposed to getting our muscle and fat from cows um, uh, and other animals. We were, we're exclusively focusing on doing bovine. Our goal is to do a beef burger um, and we hope to be doing it and being the first in Africa to do so. So it's a countdown and we want to get there as soon as possible. Uh, we were the first company to start this as well. So it is exciting. It's crazy. It's silly. It's ballsy. Um, I didn't have a salary for a, a year or so, um, but now, uh, now we seem to be a bit fine and bootstrapping is difficult, but you've got to start somewhere. Yeah. Uh, and that process is, is, will be with the process that starts our first burgers. And we're working with incredible partners along the way. We're working with beautiful universities and I don't know why I said beautiful universities but maybe because I went beautiful to beautiful minds room. beautiful minds. Oh, beautiful minds thank you there was, yeah. I've got a very I mean in the other room there's just a bunch of really smart PhDs I'm always Amazing. the stupidest in the room um yeah. so I um, I always have to try and pretend I know what I'm talking about when these guys are <laughs> um, but they're they're a good bunch of people um and uh, dedicated individuals in, and we're all based here in Cape Town um, and we're looking to expand, obviously, and grow our team and grow the facility. And ultimately, we want to be doing this because we're going to be doing this at a pilot scale, or 
yeah. demo pilot scale soon. Um, and hopefully by the end of the year, uh, somebody in, or getting it to consumers or people in South Africa uh, on a very limited scale. And then ultimately we want to build a facility that will start doing this at tons um, at, a, at a first point and then bigger and bigger and bigger. And then different species and different animals, as, as, as I said, but it all starts somewhere. Um, and we're starting, that's where we are. We're starting here and we, we're about 18 months old so we were the first ones to do it here. So it was a challenge. Uh, this wasn't, I mean, you can only imagine what it was like me talking about two years ago to potential investors and yeah. anyone that would listen to me with my co-founder, Jeff on the vault, who, who, who was the technical minded one. I mean, we, we sounded crazy. Um, and, it, and it was a lot of this. <laughs> the biggest thing was this, what you described earlier was this, um, it's happening in Europe, so, but it's not going to happen here for a while. Mm. Uh, someone recently, one of our scientists, she's with, She's from, I think she was from Blitz. Or she, but anyway, she said like one of the supervisors there were like well, cultivated meat uh, in South Africa, but that's only going to be another 10 years or five years away. And here we and are. We did it. Here we are. So um, it's been very difficult. It's been a great challenge. It's been mm. incredibly rewarding. Um, I think it's the most impactful thing that I can do personally as me. And that's what I think. It's not what I think anybody who's involved in animal rights or advocacy needs to really accept or believe but I know for me this is what I have to do and um, it's a disruptive nature and the incredible ability and this is to your point uh, about how we are having very close no that's a long way of describing we're having very constant conversations with people in retail food service um, in, uh, in the meat industry and in the um, uh, and in the distribution of food industry that, yeah. that all those people are listening and they are, are interested in getting involved in what we're up to. Um, and to me, that's how you make change because yeah. it's as, as you said, Petra, it's how you get people that are in the same, who are currently doing something and um, enabling them to drive the change is actually the way that we do. Yeah. And so, and so I'm looking at the time and I'm freaking out because I, I don't know how much time you still have. To... I've got a couple of minutes. So I'm happy okay, to talk Okay, so let's continue minutes, because you I... know what, because I'm having conversations with people and they go like, yeah, no, they still want to open up a butchery or they still want to, you know, get into like, sort of like, and I'm going to call it the conventional way or the old way of meat and providing food for people. And yet here you are, it's very futuristic, it's um it's happening now you know it's innovative it's science is so amazing right like how amazing is science and and it's a different conversation you know plus people that necessarily won't go and hunt and kill um, an animal or they kind of tend to look away now can look and eat right mm. And mm. so that sort of brings us closer because, you know, because we've, we've got three types. Okay, so we've got people who physically go and hunt and they shoot what they eat um, or who they eat. I mean, animals to me aren't just, you know, things. They are people to me just from other nations and species. And so and then we have people who want to eat meat, but they don't necessarily want to do the killing, um, you know, or the ending of the life. And then you have us who go, okay, you know, we're going to, we're quite happy with, you know, plants and vegetables and we're quite happy with that. Um, and so I have another, no, that was already answered. Uh, that was also already answered. I'm like, what about fish? Oh, okay. And so do you think that this would be possible for like ocean animals? Like, you know, the cultivating of, I think so too. Hey, yeah. that was really yeah. something so that's... So just there is... Um... There's roughly about 25 companies around the world doing what we're doing yeah um from start to finish yeah and um there are a couple of companies uh, in south africa um one looking at venison and one looking at seafood um there are very you know like the states and are are ahead of us and there are companies that are looking at crustaceans or and and, and a wide range of different yeah. sea uh, animals, uh, or marine animals, and then and almost any species that you could like. I in this last week, I've spoken to somebody who wants to cultivate lamb, who who is cultivating lamb. There is somebody who wants to cultivate animals like lion and uh, well, shark. You know, and so it's... there is. It's so the one thing is like, you know, if, let's say for shark fin. That's a very mm. If you can get that right, uh, you, that's a, that is just a, everybody in the world would agree 
yeah. cultivated shark fin yeah. soup is better than, yeah. than the current one. So I think there's just this opportunity for this industry to plug in and solve select problems that ultimately become just a complete normative way of how we do it. Yeah. And then um, I think it will just resolve the conversation. I think it will just yeah. be like, you get to have your cow and eat it too. And yes, and, and so with that, you had a very interesting conversation. It's about an hour long on discourse, um, ZA Discourse South Africa with Bronwyn, who is, what's, what's her surname? Bronwyn Williams, yeah. She's Bronwyn, a Bronwyn Williams. And so she's a futurist, an economist, and also a um, trend um, analyst. You know, so she was very direct in um, some of the questions that she'd asked you, also some of the points that she had brought across. And so for anybody who's concerned about, you know, uh, trademarking, um, who's concerned about genetically modified or, you know, the gene interference, um, that is such a great conversation to listen to. And that's one that I listened to this morning and I had to go back to some some parts of that, you know, um, because you had such a great response to it and, and you really answered it to the best of your know-how and also to the best of your knowledge. And um, and I am almost kind of sad that I have to say goodbye to you, you know, but I do still have well, a question for you. And so Animal Advocacy Africa, the Credence Institute and Zanzi Meat, I mean, this is all for animals, you know, um, it's all for, you know, minimizing the suffering and minimizing the cruelty and really providing a food system going ahead that can feed uh, the population, not just locally, not just, you know, in Africa, but also globally, I think, you know, um, South Africa, you know, all African countries are developing. So, I mean, we have a lot to offer in terms of like what we could potentially yeah. offer, you know, the world on a global scale. And let's be serious. I mean, how many people are in the food industry themselves, you know, from consumer, for consumers, you know, who know where their food comes from, you know, know what's been put into it, you know, know, um, you know, the effort that goes into it. Um, so that was not a lot of people, you know, mm. not a lot of people are. Yeah. And I mean, this is quite costly as well, Brett. And so talk to me about partnerships and investors are you still looking for partners still looking for investors to come on board i mean like what 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 are the numbers that we're talking about i can give you some indication um the animal advocate or so let's say non-profit animal advocacy work in livestock is essentially zero like zero in terms of the wide the, the international scale mm. um it's there are people doing incredible work and they do have great funding uh for funders um, but in terms of a broader outside of South Africa, and South Africa consumes a lot of the resources as well, which is, mm. I think, something that probably needs to be re-looked at. If you look at it in yeah. terms of population size, it shouldn't be South Africa. Um, but anyway, so I think, look, the, the funding is, 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 is difficult. I mean, we, with Credence and, and by extension, Animal Advocacy Africa, which is our largest program, which is essentially independent, but it's- um, mm. It's two different of, things. Just of, to clarify that to yeah. people, it's two different, you know, like I'm talking to Brett as an individual and everything that he's involved with. And then obviously the main topic would be, you know, cultivated meat, but it also links back to your passion mm. um, and yeah. your interest, you know, for animal advocacy. So that's why I linked the two, but please just this conversation, particularly when it comes to Mzanzi meats, is when we talk about Mzanzi meat, you know, that's one thing separate to creed yeah. yeah, I mean, I, and thanks for clarifying that, Petra. Like, I, I think, um, it's, it, you know, I, I'd like to, I like to speak openly about things, and I've got mm -hmm. discourse that as a podcast that I sometimes speak on, mm -hmm. and I, you know, I just like to, st I always be mindful of like how people conflate a little bit of yeah. things, but they're all they're all independent things that I've I've, I've been lucky enough to be involved with and, and yeah. start and, and help start, and and they're all now a lot of them are well, actually a lot of them are doing pretty damn well. Maybe when I'm not involved, I'm, it does even better, um, but. I think um, I think in terms of the funding aspect, it's very difficult to find life, uh, fund, funding for advocacy for livestock. I think we're trying to change that. Yeah. I think Credence um, and, and 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 again by extension, Animal Advocacy Africa has done a hell of a lot of good stuff to put Africa on the map. Um, we're starting to have more conversations. The money that we've raised is is you know it's somewhat it's it's good um, and and it's not. We can always do with more. We can always yeah. do with more funders, yeah. um, but we've got. Um, programs are got a long way to go and we've raised um, um, some uh, other projects that we're working on and we're looking to uh, hire a new marketing or rather managing director um, because I'm going to be stepping away this is actually officially I'm, I probably haven't actually said this in any public platform um, I'm going to be stepping away from credence as 
as I am listed in terms of CEO. I haven't been acting CEO for a while, but because of my focus on Mzanzi, but we're going to be bringing on somebody maybe as a volunteer in the beginning and then ultimately to be taking this organization further. Um, and, uh, and, and, and Animal Advocacy Africa is going to be extending into hopefully the global south, Asia, maybe Latin America, et cetera. So, right. so I think all those projects are very exciting and they're, very, they're, they're just starting to gather momentum and I'm, I'm very proud of them. And, and there are, Credence actually was, not to get mushy, but was named after my late father. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's quite nice to have these things sort of existing and start going. Um, so I'm very happy about that. And then in Zanzi is we've we've um, we've had it's difficult to raise venture capital in, in Africa. Uh, it's changing. It's changed a lot over the last two years, and we're very excited about the prospects of that. We've got a fantastic bunch of local and foreign-based investors who've given us you know the support, but also have the belief that we can disrupt and 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 be part of this exciting thing and bring it to Africa. Totally. I think, totally. Yeah, I think we. I think no, we. No, totally. I think we're going to do well. I think it's it's great. So, I mean, we're actually right now part of this amazing program called Brink Accelerator Program. I'd encourage anybody um, to yeah. look at the availability to get into programs where you can get funding and, and support. Yeah. And they're Hong Kong based, so we're a South African company who's got support and funding from Asia to get to do um, uh, alternative proteins and cultivated yeah. meat rather in, in South Africa and beyond. So. Um, the funding is is there. It's not easy. We've yeah, got runway, right. and I've got a, yeah. and I've got the ability to pay my rent, and I think that's um, that's <laughs> everything you need. <laughs> yeah, you know. And so I almost want to say, you know, for people that don't have the, and I think this is also why I'm having the conversation with you because I. I have to direct people to, you know, the information that I have, you know, obviously through my website and so, and I don't always have the, the time to have a conversation with people. So it's easy for me to just say, okay, well, go to my website, you know, go and check so-and-so out. And this is sort of like the, the main reason why I'm having, you know, these interviews, conversations with people. Um, but I think that this is going to be such a huge success. And I think if we can get people who are still sort of wanting to like, you know, buy the butchery, um, to rather have their money placed in this, this can go to stock market. I mean, this can go, you know, the way Beyond Meat's gone. And, you know, it will be, you know, Mzanzi Meat Co. trading and providing a food solution, you know, or a solution to a problem that we have, which is, you know, in Africa and, and how many people don't have food, right? And so, again, you know, for whoever's listening, you know, there's a difference between alternative meats and what Brett and them are doing with Mzanzi meat. And so Mzanzi meat is meat. Uh, and, and hopefully one day better. Uh, that's our ultimate goal is to improve the experience for, yeah. for people. And, and I, yeah. think, um, I think it's got the potential to do, to do a lot and it's not going to be easy. And I think it's going to be a very difficult journey and it's going to yeah. be a rewarding one for the entire industry. Yeah. Um, and also for the current in the conventional industry that has an opportunity uh, to future proof their business and be part of something that could be quite impactful to people, planet and um, animals. Well, I must say something to you, you know, before we go, um, because I still have one more question to ask you and I know then I'm going to let you go. But this morning I was, I was sort of looking out the window and the ocean, you know, I usually smell the ocean in the mornings and this morning it smelled like death to me. And so some days I'm a little bit, um, well, how I've explained to people, you know, some days I, I'm not a psychic, I'm not a seer, but I do have, you know, some premonitions, you know, at the odd time. And, and it smelled like death to me. And, and I thought about, you know, what we've been through the past couple of years with uh, COVID and we're still sort of like riding that wave, you know, and so in Zanzi meat, I mean, when you talk about, you know, cultivated meats, that also sort of lessens the, the, um, the disease aspect, you know, an unhealthy environment equals to, or equates to unhealthy animals, equates to, you know, uh, human beings that consider animals to be food, you know, and consume them. And then sort of like that goes into, you know, the body. Um, and so that would be very interesting, you know, to, to hear more about that from you guys, I think in a different conversation going forward, because we can't negate away from, you know, um, that aspect as well, you know, diseases and, 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 okay. Mm. So Brett, my final question to you, okay. 
is if you have a message, you know, if you had a message for humanity that you wanted to share in terms of like, you know, you've done the work, you leave the planet, you know, the rest of the human beings continue their existence on planet Earth. Like what would be the one message that you would want to leave behind or your legacy that you would want to leave behind that you would want people to sort of like live by? I mean, what is that? Business related, spiritually related, you know, from the heart, mind, what, what would that be? Well, you ask uh, pretty um, <laughs> good questions. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, Take it's, a moment. I, was, I don't know if I was prepared for this uh, Wednesday at 4 p.m. Um, I know, but yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you. I, I, I It would be something that I tell myself, and it's something that I would tell my, I wish I told myself more often. Um, have purpose, mm. be mindful, become content, and always wonder. Yeah. Okay. Always wonder. That's, you know, as to live that wonderful life, right? <laughs> it's, it's, and it's meant to be both. And yeah. I think, because I think of, I want to find the answer. And I know that the day that I find the answer, I'll have to keep on wondering. Okay. Yeah. Mm. Okay. So I'm going to include all the links to, you know, whatever you want me to link people to in this um, interview or the bio. Um, you know, I potentially, if I do meet investors or people that would want to uh, be part of your you know, organization or your company that I'm definitely going to send them your way. And I'm sure that we will speak again. And if anything else comes up, I am going to ask you to introduce me to somebody that you think I must speak to, you know, in a, in a future conversation. And so, but thank you so much for your time. I know that you're very busy. I thank you so much for, you know, what you're doing. I think you've, you know, the journey's just starting, you know, I know that saying goodbye to the Credence Institute may be a little bit heavy on you. However, I think, you can't go wrong, you know, with offering a solution to a problem which we do have in Africa. And, and I think if you're successful with this, you will be seen not only as somebody that advocates for animals, you know, you know, I know that's true for you, but also as somebody almost like a humanitarian, right? That's also providing a solution to people and not, you know, sending people to bed hungry. And so, yeah, definitely an interesting conversation with you. Definitely one that I'm going to share. And I'm going to, I'm going to be very um, interested to hear what people have to say about it. And so, yeah, thank you so much. Have an awesome day. He's sitting in his office at, what is it, four, four o'clock um, in the afternoon. And um, I know that I'll be speaking to you again. Yeah, sure. Thank you so much. It was wonderful. Uh, great conversation. And I look forward yes. to future ones. Thank you so much. And then just for anybody who's got more questions, please go to um, your Discourse South Africa podcast and go and listen to that uh, conversation that he had with Bronwyn. It's really super informative. I, mean, I didn't have time to ask you the questions that she has, but I think you, you know, that's such a valid conversation to go and watch and very informative and definitely want to share with people as well. So as for me, be kind to the animals, love them, don't harm them. And um, be kind to yourself as well. Okay. Okay. Bye, guys. Bye bye, Brett. Bye.